All right, so here we're going to talk about catecholamine synthesis. Now, if you watched my video on phenylalanine and tyrosine metabolism, a lot of this is going to strike you as very familiar, especially as we start out. Uh, we talked about the different ways that tyrosine can go. It can go to the TCA cycle. It can make thyroid hormone. It can ultimately make melanin. But the big thing that tyrosine does that gets hammered on on the USMLE is that it is a precursor for catecholamines, and so is phenylalanine by extension. So we're really going to focus here on how catecholamines are synthesized, and because there's not really any diseases that directly uh, affect this pathway, uh, we're going to talk about drugs that interfere with this pathway and why they're used. And, uh, and and so that can come up on the exam. Now, one way that this can come up on the exam, and I've seen test questions that do this, is they'll say, uh, okay, you've got phenylalanine and tyrosine. Point to the place in the TCA cycle where those ultimately end up. And they'll give you, they won't even list the names of the intermediates, they'll just put numbers and you kind of just have to know where fumarate is. And you have to know that it's fumarate, that phenylalanine and tyrosine ultimately become fumarate when they're metabolized down to the TCA cycle. So this does get tested. It, it, they will expect you to know your biochemistry, so you've got to know this stuff. All right, so some of this is going to be a little bit of a review if you've watched uh, my previous videos, but let's start. So we start out with phenylalanine. Of course, phenylalanine being an amino acid, and that gets converted to tyrosine. Now, the enzyme that does this is called phenylalanyl phenylalanine hydroxylase, and that uses tetrahydrobiopterin as a cofactor. Again, if this doesn't make any sense, please go back and watch that video. Tyrosine then gets metabolized through multiple steps to something called homogentisate. You may hear this referred to as homogentisic acid, pretty much the same thing. Homogentisate then gets uh, broken down into malleal acetoacetate, and that is done by an enzyme called homogentisate, I'm just going to write homogent oxidase. And then malleal acetoacetate goes through a couple steps and it ultimately becomes fumarate, and fumarate goes into the TCA cycle. And it can get broken down, it gives off NADHs and used for energy. What else can happen to tyrosine? Well, tyrosine is part of thyroid hormone. So, but it, in order to become thyroid hormone, it needs to receive iodine. So it does this through organification and, uh, well, first oxidation, then organification of iodine, which gets added onto tyrosine residues on thyroglobulin. So tyrosine is constituent of thyroid hormone. So we'll just write thyroxine here, but also triiodothyronine, so thyroxine. And the enzyme that ultimately is kind of indirectly responsible for this is TPO. Where else does tyrosine go? Well, it can be converted into DOPA. DOPA being the really the big precursor for, uh, for catecholamines. So we'll write DOPA here. And the enzyme that does this is tyrosine hydroxylase. And that also uses tetrahydrobiopterin as a cofactor. Now, DOPA doesn't really do anything on its own, but it can be converted to melanin. And this should be familiar to you if you've watched my other video. And the enzyme that does this is called tyrosinase. Tyrosinase. You would think that it does something on tyrosine, and it does, but where we get melanin is from uh, the conversion of DOPA through tyrosinase into melanin. Okay, DOPA then gets converted by an enzyme called DOPA decarboxylase, and that then becomes the dopamine. And then dopamine gets converted to norepinephrine which is the first of our uh, neurotransmitters that work on the sympathetic nervous system. And that is through an enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase. 
and that uses vitamin C as a cofactor. Oh, worth noting that dopa decarboxylase uses B6 or pyridoxine. And then finally, norepinephrine uses an enzyme called PNMT, and then that becomes the final of our neurotransmitters, and that's epinephrine. All right, so let's take a step back and look at where some of the diseases are. So we're not going to talk about these in great detail because I talked about them in the other video, but if you have deficiency of phenylalanine hydroxylase, that causes PKU. If you have a deficiency of tetrahydrobiopterin, usually through a replenishing enzyme, then that is called malignant PKU just because it's PKU, but you also have some other symptoms because tetrahydrobiopterin does a lot of other things. If you have a deficiency of homogentosate oxidase, then you have alcaptonuria. And if you have autoantibodies to thyroid peroxidase, then you have Hashimoto's. If you have a deficiency of tyrosinase, this is one of the ways that you can develop oculocutaneous albinism. And that's pretty much it when it comes to diseases that involve these enzymes. Okay, so what about pharmacologically? What can we do pharmacologically uh, for some of these things? Now, remember, what's a disease that involves dopamine or a deficiency of dopamine? Parkinson's. So we want to increase dopamine in Parkinson's. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, uh, we can give dopamine. How would we give dopamine? Well, if you give dopamine, it's not going to get into the blood or into the brain because dopamine itself cannot cross the blood brain barrier, but dopa can. So we give levodopa to patients with Parkinson's. The problem though, is that within the bloodstream is this dopa decarboxylase that's ready to just snag on to any dopa that's sitting around. So we wanna give something that inhibits peripheral dopa decarboxylase so that that dopa can stay there until it gets to the brain and then it can cross the blood brain barrier. So yes, we give levodopa, but we also give something called carbidopa. And carbidopa will maximize the amount of dopa, of levodopa in the bloodstream so that it can get in the brain and do its thing. Okay, so now let's talk about how catecholamines are broken down. There's pretty much two enzymes that do it, and they are COMT and MAO. So COMT is really the first, oops, it's really the first step in breaking all of these things down. COMT, COMT, COMT. And then the other step is mediated by MAO. And especially with dopamine, it's a particular type of MAO called MAOB. So if we, let's say we're continuing to treat a Parkinson's patient and we wanna increase the amount of dopamine Let's say these drugs get into the brain, and so we can increase the amount of dopamine or decrease the amount of dopamine breakdown. Well, we can target both of these enzymes. And so if we target COMT, or we inhibit COMT, that is a class of drug called the Capones. That's how they all end. And so the prototype drug for that is Entecapone. And of course, that is used for Parkinson's. And then what about MAOB? Can we inhibit that? Yes, we can. That's a drug called selegiline. So levodopa, carbidopa, and tacopone, selegiline, these are all drugs used for Parkinson's. Now, what about norepinephrine and epinephrine? Well, they get broken down into metanephrine and normetanephrine. So epinephrine gets broken down into metanephrine and norepinephrine gets broken down into normetanephrine. And then finally, MAO breaks these down into vanillomendilic acid. 
vanilla mandelic acid. Now, if you've got a patient with a pheochromocytoma and they're just spitting out norepinephrine, epinephrine, we actually don't measure the catecholamines in their blood. What we do do is we measure the breakdown products in their urine. So checking for VMA in their urine, checking for metanephrines and normetanephrines in their urine is a great way to tell if somebody's got a lot of epinephrine or norepinephrine in their bloodstream. So you may be asked that. Now, one way that we can reduce the breakdown of norepinephrine and epinephrine is to give an MAO inhibitor. Now, selegiline is an MAO inhibitor, but it particularly focuses on that MAOB, which breaks down dopamine into its byproduct, which is homovanillic acid, by the way. But just regular old MAO inhibitors also work on the breakdown of norepinephrine and epinephrine, and that's the idea behind the MAO inhibitors. If we're treating depression, we want to increase epinephrine and norepinephrine. We have other drugs that do that too, but the MAO inhibitors are really, were really the first ones that uh, we came out with before the SSRIs that could do that, or the SNRIs for that matter as well. So the MAO inhibitors include things like tranalcipramine, isocarboxazid, and phenylzine. So these are the MAO inhibitors. And selegiline was a special one. This is an MAO B inhibitor. So it particularly works on dopamine uh, to prevent dopamine breakdown. Okay, so that's it. So we talked about catecholamine synthesis and we talked about catecholamine breakdown. We talked about Parkinson's and some of the drugs that are used to increase dopamine at the synapses in the central nervous system. We talked about uh, drugs that increase norepinephrine and epinephrine by inhibiting their breakdown and kind of ran through sort of a review of the, uh, the, the diseases that are involved in phenylalanine and tyrosine metabolism. If you haven't watched that video on phenylalanine and tyrosine metabolism, I strongly suggest going back and watching that video as well.